It's a whole year since the woman who lived first aired. Watch on to find out why I love it so much. Welcome back to Defending Series 9. This week, I'm looking back at The Woman Who Lived, Episode 6. Now, if you haven't already seen last week's instalment, that is my retrospective of The Girl Who Died, please go and watch that now, as the chances are, as usual, I'm probably going to be referring back to that story in this review, because they are sort of a two-parter, well, interlinked episodes. They've got a shield in common anyway, and her character developed over the course of these two stories. So I'm probably going to be referring back to points I made last week, when I'm talking about how her character has changed and developed in this story. So please go and watch that if you haven't already. Otherwise, here is what I think of The Woman Who Lived. I really loved the opening. And you'd never have thought that the Nightmare was actually a shielder, especially because of her voice. Now, having said that, I don't really think the explanation of how she does that trick with her voice is particularly convincing. Thinking about how it's practice and the, the 10,000 hours, is it, to master a skill? Yeah, I know she's had all these years living on Earth to master all sorts of skills, but I wasn't really aware that the Maya chip had had such an effect on her voice box and given her all these new skills to perform all these different voices. I don't think that's quite as convincing as her learning to use a bow and arrow, for instance, as she later describes. I'm a big fan of the Doctor's little gizmo, the, the very third Doctor kind of handmade little device that he carries around using to track things down. And I also really liked how 12 was introduced into the story, because we're first presented with this robbery with a shielder, and then he suddenly sort of just emerges from this carriage and kind of adds a whole new level to it, and has this massive scrap with a shielder. And as a consequence of that, the carriage ends up going away, which is played out very well, I think. One line in particular that I really like is, sorry, I really was planning to listen this time, but I didn't. It just embodies what 12 is about as a doctor. How he's so blunt and harsh, but honest. But it just comes across as so rude, and to the audience, very amusing, I think. I think the titles were slightly out of sync, although it wasn't as bad as previous weeks. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, they might have been fine, but they just looked a little bit unusual this time around. So back to the Doctor and Ashilda. Ashilda's line, well, they're all dead now, so I guess it all worked out, really kind of stuck out for me. And it does give us an insight into her head now, into what she's like and how she's changed. And it kind of emphasises how insular and secluded she has become. I mean, me in this episode is barely recognisable, really, as a shielder that we saw in the last. The, the whole thing about me, the name me, again, it kind of embodies what a shielder is all about at this point in her life. And how selfish she is, how she's going to escape from Earth, how she's going to escape from this infinite lifespan. I mean, it also works on another level, as Shilda says, that she calls herself me because she is timeless. She has so many different names to different people and so many different meanings and relationships with different people that having one name that's very generic and very neutral is a lot easier. But the name me does also imply self-obsession and how self-centered she is, really. And that's very interesting, I think. Now, I know it's not the same house in canon, but I kind of had a little squee moment when I saw Lady Edison's residence again, which is obviously from the Unicorn and the Wasp. You probably know that Series 4 was my first series eight whole years ago, wow. But yeah, Series 4 was my first. I do remember the Unicorn and the Wasp vividly, and it was just great to see that house again. I mean, yeah, I know it's the same location in real life, but it's not the same house in the show. Although, to be honest, what's to stop it from being? You know, I'm sure there's a potential fan theory there. For example, me moves on from her life and sells her house to Lady Edison or one of her ancestors. And there you have it. I mean, I suppose the geography of the location of these houses is perhaps a little bit dodgy, but we can work on that. Um, yeah, I don't really see any reason why they shouldn't be linked, to be honest, the same house. And if that works, it's a nice little touch, but obviously completely unintentional. I thought Ashilda's flashbacks were achieved very, very well. We just get these brief little glimpses back into her past, and it definitely makes her past and her story seem a lot more convincing. I think it's because these little glimpses are so authentic to the time periods they're set in. That just makes it much more believable, and to see it as well such a rich, kind of aesthetically pleasing 
time period, you know, instantly recognisable as the period it's meant to be. It tells the story to the audience in a way that words can never do. It shows us what life was like, or a, a glimpse of what it was like for Shilda. And I think that's why it's so effective, really. Overall, Maisie Williams is definitely much better in this story, but still not amazing, and she certainly didn't deserve all the hype she got particularly from the Twitter account about the first trailer, they wouldn't stop going on about her, as I mentioned in last week's review. So she is better, but again, she's still not great. There are moments when she seems slightly unconvincing. Her performance doesn't seem as believable as perhaps it might have done with a different actress. I mean, I don't know. I've not really got anything to compare it to, but just at times, she does seem quite annoying, really. And yeah, that's a bit of a shame. But what can you do? I don't know. Having seen The Visitation, one of the few Fifth Doctor stories I have seen, I loved the reference to the Pterolaptors when Mi was talking about the Fire of London with the Doctor, and she says, did I start it? And the Doctor says, no, that was the Pterolaptors. Again, like many kind of fan references over the past few weeks of the series, it's subtle, and you don't have to have watched The Visitation to understand the whole story. I mean, it certainly enhances your viewing, and it is kind of necessary to understand this little bit of dialogue, but this isn't integral to the story. And it's subtle enough, really, for a casual viewer to just miss it or dismiss it, which is why it works so well, I think. Why many of these little fan references that I've discussed over the past week work so well. Because they don't affect the story or the plot. They're just there for the fans, and you don't necessarily have to kind of pick up on them. It's interesting um, how me seems to know about the Doctor's ship, and all those little lines. You know, how did you know I had a ship? Are we to assume that she is already associated with the Time Lords. Yeah, it's an interesting one, really, because obviously, now having seen Series 9, we know that at some point before Face the Raven, she was contacted by the Time Lords and agreed to work with them in order to trap the Doctor in his confession dial and extract the information about the hybrid. So, are we meant to believe that? I don't know. I mean, looking back as well, a shield's line at the end of the episode, when she's talking to the Doctor about how many people she's bumped into that have met him in the past, and whose lives have been affected by the Doctor. Are we to assume that she got that information and insight from them? You know, like people from episodes, I don't know, set in the Middle Ages and things, the Roman era, the Greek era. Perhaps it was those characters who talked to her about the Doctor and related to her about her experiences with him and expanded her knowledge about him, which is why she seems to know a lot more about him now. I don't know. I'm not sure I like how that's left ambiguous, really. I mean, the whole thing with the connection with the Time Lords is a little bit kind of vague anyway. I mean, I will talk about that in my Face the Raven retrospective. I'm getting very ahead of myself there. But yeah, I don't know. I think I would have liked a few more lines of dialogue where really, just confirm exactly where she got this information from. Now, last week we had some appalling scenes about babies, or one baby in particular, and the Doctor translating its crying. But this week, we get a baby scene that is in a completely different league. I am, of course, talking about the one with the shoulder where she's crying, and she has these three cradles in front of her in the flashback. It's back to the Black Death. In comparison to last week's baby scene, I mean, I know they don't have too much in common. They don't just have babies in common. But the difference is huge, how the babies are used. They're used more for comic effect in The Girl Who Died, which kind of jars with the Twelfth Doctor's personality and character. But here, using the crying as, as a symbol of mourning and sadness really that definitely works a lot better taking it seriously i don't really know where i'm going with this um but my point is that the baby scene this week was a lot better than the baby scene last week that's the main thing to take from whatever i'm saying the doctor wearing his tinted sonic sunglasses inside is pretty ridiculous i will admit but in a way it kind of adds to the comic effect and the humor of his predicament you know house robbing basically he's gone in there with a shoulder to go and steal this Eyes of Hades or whatever it is. The thing that will open the portal for, what's his name? Leandro. There we go. Um, so yeah, I think it makes it even more funny because they're already crawling around in there anyway and having to whisper. And the music definitely adds to that as well. The da -da 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 kind of music creeping around the house. But I will say that the way it can light candles by just kind of the Doctor leaning down and pressing it. Yeah, that, that works quite well, I think. Obviously, we've seen the Sonic Screwdriver itself do things like that in the past. But yeah, I'm not sure what's quite so appealing about that to me. 
I think it's where you can just kind of lean down and look at them, I suppose. I think that's the thing. Looking at a candle and being able to kind of turn it on with just a touch of your eyes or eyepiece. That's kind of the thing that makes it so cool, I think. In fact, I found the whole housebreaking scene overall very amusing. And in comparison to the girl who died and certain elements of that story that were a bit too comic, a bit too ridiculous, this is light-hearted stuff written well. It really is. The housebreaking scene is very amusing, but it doesn't jar with the overall tone of the episode. It doesn't stick out, really. And I definitely felt last week that in some places it was a bit too ridiculous, a bit too melodramatic. So that's good. I really liked how it was done in this story. And I found the fact that the Doctor and the Shoulder had to leave by the chimney absolutely <laughs> hilarious. Although it does also give us a little opportunity to explore their characters a little bit more and for them to have this little conversation about Clara. And Mee's line, one day she'll whisk away like smoke, is particularly effective. And the thing about how many Claras, you know, why haven't you made her immortal too? It's an interesting debate for the Doctor to think about his companions and kind of put it into perspective. You know, he's going to lose each one of them. He doesn't always realise it, but from the moment that he picks them up and meets them for the first time, they're always going to leave him. He's always going to outlive them. And that's a pretty dark and interesting thought, really. I thought introducing Sam Swift halfway through was a good move. For two reasons, really. The first really is because he has a bit more humour, and he's a great character. I mean, clearly Rufus Hammond is having the time of his life playing this role as a massive Doctor Who fan himself, as we've seen in other media and other TV programmes. But also because you don't really expect him to show up again at the end, at the climax of the story, as such an integral part of the climax and how it all pulls together at the end. Because obviously it's Sam Swift who is killed to open the Andrews portal. So it's quite interesting watching back to see him introduced here and kind of acknowledge that you don't really know he's gonna appear again and be quite so important later on in the story. You know, you just think he's a side character, a supporting character, and you don't really think he's gonna do too much more than just add to the comedy of it. Again, this is kind of lighthearted stuff done well because he's not just there for the comedy, he's a character as well. And he's integral to the story and the themes about immortality. You know, the Doctor says at the end, look at Sam Swift, he lives his life to the full and he can learn from that and so can a shoulder. So yeah, Sam Swift isn't just there for the comedy, he's a fully fleshed out character and he's much more important than he might first seem. Now, lots of people have said they want a shoulder to meet Captain Jack. Most of you will probably know already, but Strew and Roger who plays her servant in this story, uh, I forget his name, apologies, but he is the guy that voiced the face of Bo back in the day, like, you know, ten years ago. And obviously the face of Bo, well the implication is that the face of Bo is Captain Jack when he grows old. So I kind of like the way how technically a shielder has already met Captain Jack in the form of this servant, although obviously yeah, the only connection is off screen, but still it's a nice thought, it's an interesting thought, even though it's not really can and it doesn't work at all. Yeah, it's the same actor which is kind of amusing. So back to Maisie Williams again, I'm going to talk a bit more about her character now and her performance. She's still a bit wooden, I think. She doesn't yet seem to have quite as wide a range of ability and um, she's not able to pull off as many emotions, I think, as Capaldi or at least other actors in the story in the series. Even Clara, for example. Jenna Coleman is a lot more experienced, I think, and a much better actress. I mean, obviously, Peter Capaldi, he's had years of experience. But I don't know, is it a lack of experience on Maisie Williams' part? Oh, I, I don't know, really. I think she's been going for, what, seven years? She did start very young, from the age of 12, and she's like 20 now or something. So I don't know. But as I mentioned earlier, I just didn't find some of her emotions, some of her scenes, some of her dialogue that believable at times she just seemed quite annoying and yeah i can't really pinpoint where the fault lies but it's probably to do with her portrayal unfortunately i mean it's not the script really is it but yeah that's an interesting one to kind of ponder on really i thought the build-up to sam swift's hanging and indeed the opening of the portal was very tense and exciting and i kind of loved the way how the doctor and sam swift exchanged all this bantering and all these jokes. Because yeah, that is light-hearted, but this guy's about to die. It's tremendously dark, but light-hearted at the same time, which kind of makes it even more dark, really. 
He's about to die, and he's being forced to tell jokes to keep him alive. But there's not too much of a focus on that because it's a family show, obviously. But that's definitely an interesting thing to think about. And it does certainly make you see the scene in a slightly different light, really. I mean, essentially, it's a distraction for Sam's death. It's holding it off. All these jokes and exchanges entertaining the audience in the hope that he might be able to prolong his life or survive. Purple, the colour of death. <laughs> Series 10 story arc, anyone? No, on a more serious note, I know lots of people have kind of queried this in the past, so I took the liberty of googling it, and a quick search reveals that it was actually associated with mourning in the 19th century. So the doctor's use of the term is slightly early here, this is like the 17th century or something I think, don't quote me on that, but it also kind of feels like he's, well, not pointing out the obvious, because we didn't know that as an audience already, but by saying that, particularly as it comes from the Victorian era, and not this era, it kind of draws attention to it, which is why I think people have thought maybe it's more significant, more important, and they've questioned it. And yeah, I can understand that really, but I don't think it is anything more than just the Doctor pointing out the associations that a purple has as a colour to do with death. But it's just slightly strange. It does feel like it's trying to make a bigger point, because it's not really that subtle, if you get what I mean. So, yeah, that, that's a funny one, really. Mii's realisation about what she's done is fantastic, and it's definitely one of Maisie's best scenes, where she suddenly just turns from being so self-centred and evil, really, and siding with the Andro to kind of acknowledging her faults and what she's done, and regressing her actions, and working with the Doctor to put them right. That's a really kind of important moment for her character. A turning point, really. And as I've said, I thought Maisie Williams actually did quite a good job in this scene. And it's definitely one of Ashilda's best scenes from the series, really. Using the Maya chip, an element that was introduced in the previous story, when it kind of symbolised the Doctor not being able to live without Clara, and Ashilda finding someone like that that she couldn't bear to lose, couldn't bear to live without. That works in the context of the girl who died, but using it here to form the resolution to the climax of the woman who lived is absolutely genius. And really, it kind of ties these two episodes together as a sort of two-parter. I know already I've mentioned that it's only really Ashilda and the Doctor that are kind of constant in both these episodes. But I think really it's the Maya chips that symbolise the connection between the two. Because without the Maya chip being introduced in The Girl Who Died, this story doesn't work. And obviously that shares some similarities with the structure of a two-parter, because certain things are introduced in the first part that become more important in the second. So is it a two-parter? Well, I'm going to say no. But I know there are probably people that interpret it as one story, which again is fine. I think if Ashilda's character developed more gradually over the course of these two stories, it would be more acceptable for me as a two-parter. But because she's so different in both stories, which is kind of the point, but I just think that kind of stops me from seeing it as a two-parter because the stories are so different and they stand up on their own feet individually. Ultimately, I don't think it is a two-parter, but these episodes are linked, and they're linked by the Maya chip, which I think is a really beautiful way of linking them together, really. Overall, it's a real feel-good, everybody-lives-almost ending, which works so well for the tone of this story. And the final scene between the Doctor and me in the pub is exceptionally well-written, and it's lovely for the Tidal Waves theme to be brought up for one last time. The Doctor mentions it, I think, when he's talking about the impact that his actions have had on the shoulder and her impacts on the rest of the world, I can't remember the exact details, but I do know it's there because it's in my notes. And yeah, I just love how that line about tidal waves and ripples as well, it's seeded through the whole of this two-parter in inverted commas, which again is kind of constant, I suppose, and kind of links them together, but obviously more so in The Girl Who Died. So that's a nice touch, just have it kind of reprised here, I think. Now, properly analysing, particularly the scene in the chimney between the Doctor and shoulder, where they're talking about Clara and immortality, and why the Doctor's not made his companions immortal, that kind of changes your perspective of this final scene between the Doctor and Clara, and gives it much more significance. Particularly the Doctor's look at the end, towards, well, the camera, but also Clara. Because he knows he's going to lose her eventually, Ashilda has reminded him of that, which is ironic, because she's the one that's going to actually lead to Clara's demise. But that's for a different episode. 
And Clara's line, don't worry daft old man, I'm not going anywhere. Again, it foreshadows her death. And it's that thing about how it's almost kind of too good to be true. She said it, so now the opposite's got to happen, you know what I mean? Is it a bit in your face, that one? I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of foreshadowing of Clara's death and demise in these early episodes. Not so much in later episodes, but in these early episodes, it's quite heavy, I think. And maybe they could have toned it down a little bit more as a whole over this first half of the series. Yeah, I don't know, really. It's a tricky one. So a note to end on is the photo of a shoulder, which Clara inadvertently shows the Doctor on her phone. And yeah, it's nice to have that in there as a hint, really. A little bit of dramatic irony, if you like, for the audience. Pretty much confirming that she's going to show up again and play a bigger part in the series than we might have first believed she would. Or that's at least the implication. But it certainly implies that her character's got more to give. And basically that Ashilda isn't just limited to the confines of these two episodes, these two interlinked stories. Which is an interesting note to end on, really. And it kind of leaves you wondering how she's going to come into play later in the series. Particularly as she is a hybrid. Is she the hybrid? You know, it just leaves you with a lot of questions, wondering exactly what a shield is going to do next and how significant she's going to be in the events of the finale in later episodes. So overall, I actually really like The Woman Who Lived. It's a fascinating study uh, of death and life and mortality and immortality. I know lots of people say it's a really dull episode, but I don't understand that because it's very thought-provoking. It does make you think about whether immortality is right or not and just basically reminds you to always live life to the full. I suppose that's the main message of the story. I mean, from the offset, it's not anything particularly special or unique. So yeah, I'm not sure what I would rate it out of 10, really. I'm probably going to say an 8, I think. Or maybe a 7.5. Although I don't really like giving half scores. So I think, yeah, I'm going to stick to an 8. 8 out of 10. Uh, a very interesting episode. Nothing particularly special, but still a really great piece of writing. So before I end the review... Let's see what you have to say about The Woman Who Lived. My first comment today is from Mondasian Monster, who, as you can probably tell, didn't really like this episode much. But I beg to differ, really. I think it was quite interesting. I didn't mind Leandro. I mean, I've not really touched on him in my review, but I think he served his purpose. He definitely did the job in the episode, and his design, he looked pretty good as well. So kudos to the design department for that. The Hybrid is Me says, not a bad episode. Better than the girl who died, yeah, I agree with you there, but not a fan of the cat monster though. Yeah, I don't really know why people don't like Leandro that much. I mean, he's not one of my favourite villains or monsters ever, but as I say, he did the job, and for what he was, I don't really have any problems with him myself. Goodness me, it seems not many people like this story at all. Sontaran123 says, One of the worst Doctor episodes ever. And I asked him to elaborate, and he said, The story tries to make you feel for something for a shielder, but you don't feel anything, and the humour is terrible and it drags. Yeah, Eshilda was slightly dodgy, but I thought the humour definitely worked better here than it did in The Girl Who Died, and I certainly wouldn't call this one of the worst episodes of all time. DWFA 2014 says, It was one of the most poor Doctor episodes to be created, and the character me was annoying, and so was the villain. Yeah, again, I don't really agree. Sorry. <laughs> um... But we're going to end on a more positive note, as always, with a comment from Isaac Whitaker Dakin, who says, It was good to see the consequences of immortality and those who get left behind by the Doctor. However, the third act felt a little bit rushed, and the Andro was underdeveloped. I felt this should have been episode 9 or 10, as the audience would have felt the passage of time along with a shoulder, but I'd call it a fairly solid story. Yeah, I agree with most of what you're saying there. I mean, I think you kind of feel a bit like me about the Andro, really. Yeah, he wasn't the best villain ever, but he kind of did the job, really. And yeah, I guess there were some small pacing issues, but on the whole, I think the structure worked well. Now, should it have been later in the run? I'm not sure about it being episode 9 or 10, because that would have put it much closer to face the Raven. But at the same time, I kind of do feel there should have been something in between these stories, just to kind of separate them out a bit more. So yeah, I'm not really sure what I'd say to that. I do agree with you sort of, but I'm not really sure how I would have juggled that issue if I was a showrunner mapping out this whole series. Although I think what they did do worked all right. So thank you very much for watching this Defending Series 9 retrospective review. Please comment your thoughts on The Woman Who Lived below. I'd love to hear what you think of this story and tweet me or comment below your thoughts on the Zygon invasion so I can feature them in next week's review. And I'll see you then for that. So again, thanks so much for watching and bye for now.